put the earth inside a man-made environment, the earth becomes an art form. And nature is over. Ecology is born. The idea of a totally programmed planet takes the place of a, just a, a haphazard nature. I, I wanted to ask you about this. It's one of, a, Good. one of the questions I had written down. You have, I'm flattered to say, anticipated many of them. But the word ecology is an ancient word. Yeah. And ecology has many meanings in our world, and uh, it, including ECHO, echo. It's a world of resonance in which everything happens at once. Everything bangs against everything. An ecological world is a world of echo land. It's a world of simultaneous resonance in which people instinctively feel that everything affects everything. But the, the, the original meaning of ecology and in, in in its Greek origin... Is not very clear, is it? <laughs> the echos is not a very um, simple um, etymology. I had, if you've uh, had a dig into the etymology of ecology, you'll find that um, it's not by any means plain. And uh, it's um, an, a nice uh, echo word, and it's a nice a resonant pun word. It um, takes you into a space where there can be more than one meaning simultaneously and contradictory meanings. Um, when you move into a world of contradictory simultaneous meanings, you're in the world of puns. Of which you are very fond of. I well, puns are simply ways of seeing more than one side or hearing or taking uh, more than one side of a thing at a, ground, at a jump. The old, uh, it used to be done in terms of the Irish bull. You never hear any more about the Irish bull. But the Irish bull was uh, defined once, I think, by, uh, by this way. When you see three cows standing in a pasture, the one that's sitting is the Irish bull. Now, this is a way of trying to say simultaneously that the Irishman is not a rational, logical person in our way. That he knows very well that the Irish bull is lazy. And he does not intend uh, to um, be uh, dictated to by women. And so, the Irish bull is, if there are three cows in a passenger, the, a passage, uh, pasture. The Irish bull is the one that is sitting. This is a very irrational statement, but it captures instantly this peculiar quality in a, an illogical world. A, um, a title like cliché to archetype is simply a way of drawing attention to the fact that simultaneously the most profound things and the most superficial things are the same. And when you scrap nature you retrieve the most ancient forms of cliché from the world of the unconscious and the world of um, the occult. Because the, the word cliché in our own time has come to have a rather invidious meaning. Literary. And, and you don't it's use a, it. It's a literary meaning. Yes, but you, you it, don't use it in that sense. No, I use it um, in the sense of any repetitive activity, and it can be... Yeah, on an assembly line, or it can be... The word comes from stamping uh, paper forms with an impress. And um, it is itself a term from printing. That's in French. It's, a photo it's taking a photograph. It? And imprinting it. Mm -hmm. It's not just the uh, photographic light act. But um, this um, fact that a, a new environment such as radio, any new service environment is a cliché. It isn't verbal, but when printing was new, it created a total new environment of services that became a cliché. Now, you, you have written, Professor McLuhan, that printing created nationalism and it created yes. individualism. How, how, how well, did it do that? Print, for example, created what we call the reading public. There were no reading, there was no reading public in the Middle Ages, in the age of the manuscript. There were many kinds of publics. Today, at very high speeds of information, there is no longer a reading public. There are multitudes of reading publics, multitudes of listening publics, viewing publics, many, many kinds of publics. There used to be, in the 19th century, a much more unified public. 
in the 18th century very much so too. But since the electric age, we have decentralized and nationalism is collapsing on all fronts in our time into tribalism or into all sorts of little small cultures. Well, with the coming of print, it became possible for the first time for people speaking a single language to have a common political form based upon the written word. And nobody expected this. No, nobody dreamt that there could be such a thing as a national unity coming out of a, of a uniform printing press in which their own language was translated into this visual medium. What, what then is the future of, of print? What will happen to it? Well, as you can see right now that printing takes many forms, unexpected new forms, including color. Printing, I should think, is in a more revolutionary state today of innovation and development than it has ever been. And we speak of prints, voice prints, where printing has now extended its area of, of efficacy to many, many fields of the photographic and to the video world and uh, to various forms of recording and so on, which are still prints. Printing has become an enormously diversified area, whereas formerly it had been relatively limited. And the going with each new technology is a new public. Now, we're not prepared for this, and it means uh, that na national unity breaks down very rapidly under these uh, fast-moving conditions. And so all sorts of dissident groups pop up, where formerly there'd been a relative uh, homogeneity. Now, this is not necessarily good, and I think it may well be that people will anticipate many of the consequences of innovation in the future and say no. As in the case of the SST, perhaps. Possibly. Mm -hmm. I think that we are moving rapidly toward a time when people will inquire about what will be the consequences of this innovation as it hits into this and that field. And people will say, well, it, it will be uh, revolutionary and astounding, but I don't think we're able to take it. I don't think that we can absorb that variety of shocks and that variety of changes in a very short time. Most people take a long while to adjust to quite simple changes. And when invited to readjust their entire lives every few years to very vast changes, people tend to fall apart. The loss of private identity under electric conditions has created dropoutism of a fant on a fantastic scale. May, may I ask you a point on that? You have written or uh, spoken of electric circuitry as the first new tool in a thousand years. Uh, um, Am, am I quoting you correctly? I'm, I don't recall exactly where that might have been said. I think it's probably defensible as a position. Although this uh, electric circuit has created a vast number of new tools related to many other fields. That, that is, without the electric circuit, we wouldn't have dentistry as we know it. And when you think of the number of services related to that circuit, um, it, is, it doesn't limit the uh, circuit to being a uh, single or simple sort of tool. The circuit as a, um, an instrument, a technology, is in a very ambiguous state in scientific quarters. Uh, most people think of a circuit as something that moves, but the scientists are by no means sure of what moves, if anything, in electric circuits. Uh, there may be fields that form here and there in the circuit. There may be uh, new patterns and postures of particles. But whether anything actually moves, I think, is in great doubt. This another, is another example of the visual man thinking of connected movement as inevitable. Our scientists are still inclined to make visual models of light particles and particles that move at the speed of light, for which no visualization is possible. But this is the bias of a highly visual culture. I think our youngsters today, God, they're coming up through the uh, rock and roll division are totally devoid of any need to visualize. I know you 